Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you CRAMSurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Uh, tonight we're going to have a look at um, a paper highlighting the results of a rather sizable quality improvement project run in one of the biggest tertiary centres in the Netherlands, uh, Utrecht. Following that, Professor Saba is uh, going to talk about validity and reliability. I'll leave you to it. Uh, so yeah, so hello everybody. I'm Ben. I'm one of the uh, emergency general surgery fellows, uh, currently doing a, a clinical fellows job over at St. James's. So um, the paper that we're going to be talking about tonight is entitled Association of a Liberal Fasting Policy of Clear Fluids Before Surgery with Fasting Duration and Patient Wellbeing and Safety. So this was published in uh, JAMA Surgery on the uh, January the 4th uh, of this year, so a relatively recent paper. So it'll be me and myself, uh, me and Gio presenting it. Right, <clears throat> a bit of background about uh, where this paper comes from. Well, I'm sure you've all noticed uh, working in pretty much any NHS hospital that has to do with surgery, that fasting guidelines are generally uh, pretty poorly implemented. And this, this statement comes from both a variety of audits that has been conducted, uh, not just in the UK, but throughout Europe, as well as our daily practice. I mean, if I had a penny for every time I've been asked to prescribe some IVIs um, for a patient that was fasting from midnight, um, I would probably have about 10, 20 quid. Uh, so not rich, but certainly happens quite often. Uh, it is also quite well known and it's common practice in pediatric patients to uh, adopt a very liberal preoperative fluid uh, fasting policy where patients can get um, uh, fluids uh, up to about 30 minutes before an operation, particularly express uh, breast milk. Uh, and uh, sorry, I've just uh, muted that. Um, <clears throat> So um, originally we thought that um, um, adult stomach was just emptying slower than kids stomach and that's why uh, we were not doing that in adults actually. Uh, most recent studies that uh, looked at gastric emptying in adults compared to children demonstrated that that's not the case. So there is a biological base to support the use of a liberal um, fasting policy in adults as well and this is where this paper kind of falls in. So ball back to uh, Ben for uh, um, a few more details. So uh, looking at the study as a whole, the primary aim was to evaluate the successfulness of uh, implementation, a stepwise implementation of a liberal clear fluid policy, um, mainly with regards as a primary outcome, fasting duration, but also secondary outcomes looking at well-being and safety in adults, including regurgitation and risk of aspiration. So when breaking this down into the PICO format, the population in question was all adults over the age of 18 at a single centre tertiary hospital in the Netherlands. The intervention was the implementation of a liberal fasting policy over a period of five years uh, in a stepwise manner in different sections of the hospital. And the comparison was a standard fasting policy, which we all no, as, as being the commonly used policy throughout the UK, which is no food uh, six hours prior to the procedure with clear fluids up until two hours before. Primary outcomes looked at initially changes in fasting duration between the two groups and secondary outcomes looked at preoperative thirst, uh, the amount of fluid ingested preoperatively and postoperative um, patient well-being, including nausea and vomiting and the requirement for antiemetics during this time. So a few words about the methods they employed. Um, as you can probably guess from the titles, this is a QI type methodology. And this study was conducted between January 2016 and July 2021. As Ben mentioned, this is data from a single tertiary hospital in the Netherlands. Uh, Eligible patients were pretty much anyone admitted for non-emergency procedure uh, under general anesthetic um, during the study period. And the liberal fasting policy that they adopt is basically allowing intake of clear fluids 
up until they get to the anesthetic room uh, with a maximum of one glass per hour. And they are allowed to take one full glass of fluid with the tablets, which is generally paracetamol. Overall, uh, the process gets implemented into six steps that uh, Ben is going to go into some details about now. Go for it, Ben. So as uh, as Gio and I both mentioned, this was a stepwise implementation of a liberal uh, fasting policy, which the authors recognised would take a little while uh, to be able to successfully implement within the hospital. So I'll quickly run through the six steps. So the first two steps basically focused on a change in the registration forms, i.e. the uh, for documentation forms used in both remote locations, that being smaller uh, smaller theatres um, based on the smaller specialties, looking at, for example, ENT and ophthalmology, and then the main operating theatres. So this was done in 2016, early 2017. Step three through to six was implementation of the liberal fluid policy in different areas of the hospital. Step three looked at it in ambulatory surgery locations. Four was looking at it in minor surgery, uh, such as day case or scheduled elective, uh, straightforward, uh, simple cases. Step five looked at it in major, um, major surgery, which included major sections, more complex procedures. And step six looked at it, in, again mentioned in remote locations. Now back over to Gio. Yeah, let's start um, having a look at the results. So this is just a brief uh, table comparing the two uh, groups. As you can see, they had about 60,000 patients in the standard policy across the study period and about 17,000 in the liberal um, policy. As you can see throughout the board, characteristics of the two groups are pretty similar, both in terms of uh, basic preoperative and sort of gender characteristics, for example, as well as BMI uh, and uh, comorbidities. Um, so the two groups are, even if uh, obviously uh, there's no randomization to a certain extent, uh, reasonably well comparable uh, with each other. Um, if we then um, jump a little bit forward, and we look at the number of patients included uh, and how they've got split into the two groups and sort of the main sort of worrying outcomes that we are all thinking about. Um, you can see how um, regurgitation uh, in the standard policy happened in 105 patients, uh, in the liberal fasting policy in 41 patients. Um, and as you can see, the number of actual aspiration pneumonias, which is sort of the worst thing that can happen really in these cases, really small in both groups. So we're talking about two out of 17,000 in the, in the liberal fasting policy and three out of nearly 60,000 in the standard fasting policy. Now, Ben is going to go into some more details about these results. Uh, go for it. So as mentioned earlier on the, in the presentation, the primary outcome um, was looking at the changing fasting uh, duration. Now, the important thing from that point of view is, sorry, one second. The important thing from that point of view is that there was a significant decrease in the changing fasting duration after implementation of the liberal policy, um, decrease in just over three hours. Looking at the left-sided table, uh, as you can see, it also takes into account those secondary outcomes that I mentioned earlier on. Post-operative nausea and vomiting and use of antiemetics decreased between the standard uh, and the liberal policies from looking at between 10.5% and 11% down to around 9.5%, and that was highly significant. The other things to bear in mind was looking at the uh, preoperative intake and as you can imagine a liberal fasting policy uh, allowed for those patients um, who did have preoperative thirst to obviously be able to have a drink and, and, and the ingestion of increased amounts of fluid before the operation was clearly evident in the liberal fasting policy. Looking at the right side of time series analysis uh, this basically breaks down each of the uh, locations that were mentioned uh, and determining the areas in which the liberal fasting policy was imp implemented. As you can see, the first three areas uh, showed a key decrease in the duration, uh, fasting duration. But looking at location four, this was the only area uh, and that was defined as the remote location. This seemed to be the only area in which it uh, there was no significant decrease in fasting location, uh, fasting duration, and this wasn't significant. 
Now, there are a couple of reasons why that might be, I guess, one uh, potentially being that uh, the, the remote locations um, with the smaller theatres, fewer numbers of staff were, weren't quite as able to implement that fasting policy. Um, but again, that's something that is uh, discussed in very little detail in the paper. I'll pass back over to Gio to talk about the limitations. Yeah, so the authors do uh, pick on some uh, of the limitations of this study. Um, first of all, um, as you can probably guess, the main worry when we are talking about a liberal fasting policy is obviously regurgitation and uh, associated aspiration pneumonia, which can be incredibly morbid uh, for this patient. So um, this study is obviously underpowered to conclude on the safety of a liberal fasting policy. Said that, uh, given that the outcome is incredibly rare, we are talking about uh, one, two, three events out of 60,000 patients. Um, designing a study powered to detect that difference um, would actually be quite challenging and the number of patients needed to be enrolled would be very, very, very big. Um, obviously, this was an observational study, so it, it's QI methodology, as, as we mentioned a couple of times already. Um, therefore, Despite the two groups being reasonably comparable, there are still residual confounding factors that cannot be corrected for or that cannot be um, aided by randomization, if you like. And there is a strong author and effect. Um, if you think about it, the primary outcome of this paper is reduction in uh, <clears throat> fasting time uh, preoperatively. Um, the fact that everybody is aware of the fact that these policies being implemented, um, per se, it does generate a strong halo effect on the primary outcome itself. Uh, and this kind of cascades throughout for all the other outcomes, um, I believe. Um, but uh, Ben is going to um, mention a few more things now. Yes, yeah, so as Joe quite rightly touched upon, the, the paper does mention the Hawthorne effect uh, in the measurements used and the outcomes of the study. Um, but I, I don't really think it emphasises in enough detail uh, to, to the degree of which it does Im impact the results. Um, measuring, as you can imagine, in any standard hospital, measuring the exact fasting duration is probably not well documented, if at all documented. Um, and being aware of the fact that they're uh, measuring how many how long patients are fasting for will have had a significant impact on the results another thing to bear in mind from the the quite lengthy results section of the paper is that the patients in the liberal uh, fasting policy received significantly higher intraoperative antiemetics and number of antiemetics compared to the standard policy now as you can imagine, increased numbers of antiemetics uh, intraoperatively will predict the uh, reduction in postoperative nausea and vomiting, but this is not actually mentioned uh, in the self-reported limitations of the study, even though it's, it should be one. Other things to bear in mind are the fact that there was no mention of the uh, type, um, whether the L LMAs were used or endotracheal tubes were used, uh, as literature quite rightly it shows use of uh, endotracheal tubes would reduce the risk of regurgitation and subsequent aspiration but this isn't taken into account and this this compounder isn't taken into account in the results of the study um, another other facts uh, factors which are important are patient involvement now there's no mention in the study of how aware patients were uh, that they were able to have a liberal uh, fasting policy in place and they were able to drink up until you know a few a few uh, minutes before the operation now it's really that's a really important fact because as you can imagine i don't think patients are aware of how long they need to fast for exactly how long they need to fast for before an operation but that would impact their ability and need to be able to drink before an operation Use of a single tertiary hospital does limit the external validity of the study. And uh, the other thing to, to mention is that do, an do anaesthetists always document the fact that someone has regurgitated? Uh, exactly, you know, the definition of regurgitation, I imagine, has uh, different understandings amongst anaesthetists themselves. And actually, would they consider that something that needs to be documented? I'm not entirely sure they would. The final thing to mention is what would be an acceptable difference, uh, for example, in a liberal fasting policy, would 
and what would the acceptable difference be in the increased number of patients regurgitating or having an aspiration? And what would be acceptable for the patients? You know, say if two more patients out of 10,000 aspirated as a result of the liberal fasting policy, would patients on the whole be happy to have that increased risk if it meant they could drink a little bit more before an operation? That's not really touched upon or mentioned in the study, but something I really think needs to be discussed in a little bit more detail. So finally, on to the conclusions. So the conclusions stated by the, uh, the paper suggests that a liberal fasting policy is associated with a clinically relevant reduction in fasting duration, as well as improved patient well-being with regards to preoperative thirst and post-operative nausea and vomiting, though, as we have stated uh, earlier on, there is a question mark over exactly what degree that improves the post-operative nausea and vomiting. However, it's important that to mention that the study was underpowered to conclude on the safety of a liberal fasting policy protocol. So in, in that sense, they, they weren't able to say exactly what degree of increased risk of regurgitation and aspiration uh, was, has resulted from implementation of the liberal fasting policy. And that's just a quick summary table for your information, uh, summarising um, the kind of good and bad points about the study. Thank you very much. As usual, a brief summary of the discussion we've had about the paper. As hinted during the presentation, the discussion focused predominantly on the definition of primary and secondary outcomes and how relevant it is to split primary and secondary outcome in a non-RCT setting. While in an RCT it's essential to define a primary or a set of primary outcomes, e.g. composite outcomes, in order to uh, perform an adequate sample size calculations, uh, this is not necessary in, uh, for example, a cohort study or a quality improvement study like this. Um, furthermore, um, it is important to highlight how feasibility of implementation of an intervention like this would not necessarily require a sample size of um, nearly 80,000 patients, but could simply be assessed with a much smaller sample size. A much bigger sample size, on the other hand, would be required to determine the safety profile of an intervention like this in association with aspiration pneumonia. So it is important to bear this in mind when designing a study of this magnitude. We reiterated again how, um, in a context like this, uh, identifying a difference in a safety outcome would be a key element of the implementation strategy and patient's involvement concerning this would be equally essential. For example, as a patient, um, would you accept this even a slight increased risk of aspiration pneumonia with everything that, that implies, including potentially an intensive care admission, even a prolonged one, for the sake of having a couple of extra glasses of water? It might be that the patient does. It might be that the patient doesn't. It is really difficult from... Um, this report to determine whether these aspects were taken into account. Uh, we uh, looked at some definitions associated with the secondary outcome, particularly aspiration, aspiration pneumonia, and uh, despite the authors attempting to standardize such definitions, it is really hard to say whether um, these definitions were applied in a strict way, as they are still very much open to interpretation. Right, I'll leave you to Professor Saba's presentation on validity and reliability. So um, I'll talk about validity and reliability in, in, in surgical research. Um, I'm only going to touch upon the very brief principles of validity and reliability, the massive topics in, in, in and of themselves. And I've got a few um, relatively straightforward questions at the end. So um, if you're still with us, if you don't mind um, putting your answers in the chat box, Geo can maybe read out the answers and, and comment. Um, uh, I thought um, I'll try a few questions um, at the end of a short talk and see how that works. Okay, so we'll talk about what validity and reliability mean. Um, I'll explain some uh, types of validity, types and subtypes, and a couple of types of reliability. Again, uh, I'm gonna keep this very brief. Uh, I'm not an expert. Uh, I do come across um, these aspects of validity and reliability in my own research and in my reading of literature. And I think it's useful to uh, refresh our memories as to what these actually mean uh, and hence this talk. 
And like I said, I've got a couple of examples and questions um, after my explanations, and then we'll summarize. So hopefully it won't be too long. So uh, we've all heard of these um, concepts um, in, various, uh, in various aspects of our um, research and practice. There are all sorts of terminologies that um, we hear and we sometimes, sometimes perplexed by, worried about, that we don't fully understand them. And, and uh, we're going to be um, summarizing some of these, uh, uh, a few of these concepts. And we'll keep it as, I'll keep it as simple as I possibly can. So essentially, um, I would look at these two terms as measures of quality. So we'll talk about validity first and then uh, reliability. So validity simply refers to the accuracy of a measurement or a test or a scale. And it refers to the degree to which the test or the measurement that you do truly measures the concept or the construct it is supposed to measure. Now, if you think of an example, the one uh, that came to my mind straight away was um, the SF36. So you may have heard that SF36 is a measure of quality of life. And it looks at various domains of quality of life. And these include uh, physical domains, emotional domains, and social domains. And essentially, um, if you want to measure the quality of life of an individual or your patient, um, and you have this tool in hand, you want to look at this tool and say, this actually truly measures the quality of life in my patient. Okay, so that's what um, validity refers to. The reliability, on the other hand, refers to the consistency of the result of a test. In other words, it relates to the degree to which the test result or the measurement is free of error. So if you look at the SF36 quality of life measurement tool again, and um, if you want to say that this is a reliable tool, um, you want to um, make sure that the score you get on the SF36 in a single patient, let's say you, you, you ask the patient to do the score three or four times within a day, uh, you would expect the score to be the same if the test is reliable. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense. I've got another uh, example. We'll look at it slightly differently. Let's say um, you want to ass assess uh, the ability by which you can get to, uh, you can uh, throw darts and you aim at the center of the, um, uh, at the middle black circle. And let's say you have five goals with darts and let's say these are the results that you get. So you, you aimed five times and these are the results of your five throws. And you can see that you're very close each time um, you, you throw the dart, you're quite close to the other four, but you're a bit away from the center of the circle. So essentially you've been what you would call consistent, but not very accurate because far, you're far away from the center. So uh, you would be considered to be reliable but not very valid, okay? Let's say your friend uh, has another um, uh, five goals and he or she, um, her results are there on the right side of the screen. And you can see that um, um, his or her results are a little bit less consistent in that they're slightly all over the place compared to yours, yeah? But they're a bit more accurate because they're more close to the um, central black circle. So his or her results would be less reliable, but more valid. Okay, so I hope this gives, uh, this conveys um, some meaning to these terms, validity and reliability. Right, so lots of different types of validity. And, uh, and these concepts and these terms are often used in psychological research. And in psychological research, uh, you deal with lots of what we would call unobserved constructs, or you could say abstract constructs, right? Uh, whereas in surgical research, a lot of the time we have uh, really defined observable um, outcomes or constructs, okay? But still a number of types of validity are very re relevant to surgical research. And so it's important for us to uh, 
um, have uh, some understanding of these concepts. The first type of validity is what we um, refer to as content validity. And this refers to whether the tester instrument measures what is important and whether it measures everything that is important with regards to the concept of the construct, okay? So these are referred to as relevance and comprehensiveness. In other words, that particular tool should be relevant and comprehensive. Now, for example, if you want to measure um, the weight of 100 patients, you take a weighing scale and, and uh, you, as long as the weighing scale is accurate, um, you, you check the weight and uh, you have what you, um, what you want to um, have, what the data that you want to have. If, for example, you want to calculate the BMI of your 100 patients, then you need a, a weighing scale and you need a measuring tape yeah, to measure your height. If, for example, you want to assess nutritional status, then you and I know that weight and height alone are not good um, or sufficient measures of nutrition. And you'd want to measure lots of different things such as albumin, hemoglobin, hemoglobin and maybe levels of different kinds of vitamins and so on and so forth, right? So you can see that whatever tool or measure you have in your hand, you've got to look at it and see whether it really measures what you actually want to measure. Right, so um, you've probably also heard of the term face validity and face validity is basically a type of content validity, which um, you used to say that on the face of it, this tool uh, measures what you want to measure, okay? So a face validity gives you an overall assessment of the tool. For example, um, based on what we've discussed just now, we talked about nutritional status. We say on the face of it, BMI is not a valid assessment of nutrition, okay? So you can see how face validity is a subjective assessment. And, uh, um, as with face validity, any type of content validity, the assessment is, is actually quite difficult. You need to be able to um, get the information about the construct and the context, or the context meaning the environment in which you're assessing, whatever you're assessing. You need to think about what is actually being measured, okay? And if you're not the expert, you need to get an expert panel to assess if your measurement is relevant and comprehensive, okay? And then you use a framework to assess the correspondence or the correlations between the measurement and the construct. So it becomes a bit abstract. It's a bit difficult to do uh, very well. And, and uh, like I say, this is a subjective process, assessment of content validity. The next type of validity, uh, which I think we as surgeons can relate to quite well, is what we refer to as a criterion validity. And this simply refers to the extent to which um, your instrument, uh, your measurement correlates with the gold standard. So the key thing here is that you have a gold standard. Now there's a type of uh, criterion validity called concurrent validity. And this is um, uh, the classical example uh, of this is the validity for diagnostic tests. For example, if you want to look at um, CRP as a diagnostic test for appendicitis in patients coming to the A&E with right left force of pain, then essentially you're looking at concurrent validity. Now, predictive validity is um, validity um, that applies to predictive or prognostic scores. So uh, here, the gold standard is not immediately available to you. The gold standard test or the outcome will become apparent over time. And therefore, um, you're looking at a, a test that's trying to predict what the gold standard will be over time. And a classic example would be a nomogram. So if you devise a nomogram based on, say, um, stage, grade, um, age of the patient with breast cancer, and you want to predict five-year survival, then this would be a, a good example uh, for predictive validity. You want to see if the nomogram has good predictive validity in terms of it being able to give you a good idea of what the five-year survival of your patient will be. 
Um, so these um, are uh, things that are a little bit easier to assess. So lots of different statistical methods of assessing how good your concurrent validity or your predictive validity um, is going to be. And these really depend on the data type, what type of uh, uh, data uh, you have with regards to the gold standard and with regards to what you're measuring. For example, uh, if it's a binary um, a variable, uh, you want to know if the CRP is high or low, and you want to predict whether a patient has appendicitis or not, then you look at the sensitivity and specificity of the CRP. Okay, If you have a CRP as a continuous variable, as a measurement variable, and uh, you want to predict the risk of um, uh, appendicitis, then you can use an ROC curve. We've talked about ROC curves before, receiver operating characteristic curves. Right. The third type of validity, so we've talked about content validity, of which face validity is an important type. We then talked about criterion validity, where you have a gold standard, and, uh, and, and uh, you look for how valid your measurement tool is. So the third type of validity is uh, what is referred to as construct validity. Uh, and then this um, is useful in settings where you do not have a gold standard. So construct validity refers to how well the instrument measures the construct in the absence of a gold standard, okay? So um, this is less powerful than criterion validity. And also, simply because there is no gold standard, it's a bit more difficult to conceptualize and assess. So I won't spend too much time on this trying to explain this, because I myself do not have any personal experience of um, testing for construct validity in any of the research that I do. Um, but essentially, there are three aspects to it. The first is structural validity, which looks at how well the uh, tool does uh, with regards to measuring all the different dimensions of your construct. The second is hypothesis testing. And here you look to see how well your tool does compared to other tools measuring similar or dissimilar concepts. Because you don't have a gold standard, so you just have to go and uh, compare your tool with other tools that are out there. And the third aspect is uh, what is referred to as um, cross-cultural validity, wherein you're looking to see how well a tool can be adapted to other populations or other cultures. So there might be a quality of life tool like the SF36 that works very well in the UK, and you wanna go and apply this in a population in Asia where the language is different, and, and uh, there are many, many contextual and cultural differences. And then you wanna see how well this particular tool um, measures quality in that different setting. And uh, like I said, assessment of whether the tool really has construct validity is, is quite uh, complicated and um, uh, it takes, um, uh, it's quite extensive and takes a long time to do. Can I uh, make another example of that? Yeah, sure. If that's right. Uh, on, on, if you think about a test or any test that you, you're taking as a doctor, that test is supposed to be able to identify how good of a doctor you are or how good of a doctor you're going to be, or how good of a surgeon you're going to be. Okay. So the, con the construct validity of the MRCS, if you like, is supposed to be related to how well the MRCS is able to pick up good SHOs that are going to be good registrars. Yeah, the score of the MRCS, yeah. Supposedly, if you yeah. apply the concept of construct validity to a test. Yeah. And the same goes for the FRCS. So if I take the FRCS and I have a good grade, I'm supposedly going to be a good consultant. That doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but that's yeah. how yeah. construct validity works for a test, for example. Yeah, perfect. Sorry. Amazing. That's a really good example because, again, there is no gold standard. So who? what is the gold standard for a good surgeon or a good trainee? And, and there can be all sorts of different um, attributes to what makes a good um, surgeon. Uh, and then you're hoping that your FRCS score or your MRCS exam score um, will relate to many different um, uh, aspects of uh, being a good surgeon. Yeah, so that's, a, uh, that's a good one, good example. Okay, so 
when we talk about validity, um, like I said before, we talk about content validity, criterion validity, and construct validity. But we also talk about validity when it comes to research papers. So we, we critique research papers and we say, oh, this paper is not very valid, um, or this paper is not very, the results of this paper is not very generalizable. So this is where you come across these uh, the two terms, which we've not talked about before. And these are um, internal validity and external validity. So these are concepts that relate to the quality of an entire study, not a measurement, not a tool. Okay, so internal validity refers to whether the design and conduct of a study has resulted in an accurate answer to the question that's being asked. In other words, simply was the study free of bias? So if you're doing a randomized controlled trial, if you haven't done the randomization properly, or if you think you've blinded your patients, but the patients really knew what treatment they're getting, or the patients that were randomized to treatment A actually did not get treatment A, and there were many such patients, in other words, you had lots of protocol deviations, these issues or problems may not uh, may stop you from getting to the truth, and therefore you might say the study is not internally valid. In other words, the quality wasn't great because of problems with the design and conduct of the study. Okay, so this is internal validity. External validity refers to whether the findings of the study can be generalized to other settings or contexts. In other words, um, let's say you've done a randomized controlled trial of robotic hernia repair and compare that with uh, laparoscopic hernia repair, incisional hernia repair. And let's say you've shown that the results of the robot are superior to laparoscopic hernia repair. But the problem is um, in your study, in your center, that might be the case, but would this be a, a, the case in another center, say in another district general hospital, in another population, in the hands of other surgeons who may have different experience and expertise compared to your own centers? Okay, so that's referred to as external validity. Now there's another term called ecological validity. I wouldn't worry too much about this. This is a, a type of external validity. And this is not a term that's used very much in surgical research. And it was previously proposed as a concept to explore if the results in the lab would be replicable in real life. In other words, it's a kind of external validity, like I said before, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, so we've talked a lot about uh, validity. What about reliability? Like I mentioned before, reliability um, is related to um, errors in measurement, okay? So if there's a lot of error, that means um, the tool um, or the measurement is less reliable and vice versa. As you probably uh, can imagine, there are two types of reliability. One is inter-rate reliability and the other is intra-rate reliability. And uh, just to think of an example, uh, let's say you want to measure tumor size after radiotherapy or chemotherapy on uh, CT or PET scans, and you have a, a radiologist do all the measurements uh, of uh, the tumor on the scans of all of your patients after a particular treatment. Now, obviously, there, uh, there can be different ways in which the actual measurement can be made, and there could be differences um, between um, radiologists, and there could also be differences within the same radiologist. If you ask the same radiologist to take the measurements uh, another day, they might give you slightly different values. Okay, so that's what is referred to as inter-rater and intra-rater reliability. Remember, reliability um, refers to consistency. So each time the same radiologist or somebody, another radiologist is doing the measurement of the same tumor in the same patient, you want the results to be consistent. So assessing reliability is relatively straightforward. Just like with criterion validity, uh, there are lots of different methods by which you can assess whether somebody is being consistent or not. And again, these methods are really based on the type of data. Now, uh, I'll just mention the statistical methods. Uh, you may have come across some of these before. So if you have a continuous variable, um, so if so somebody's um, allocating a score to a tumor, tumor based on its CT appearances, and that score ranges from say zero to 25, 
Uh, and if you've got two sets of radiologists looking at the same set of scans, then you want to see if they are being consistent, then you use a particular statistical uh, parameter called intra-class correlation coefficient uh, or Pearson's row correlation coefficient. So, uh, so that's for continuous variables. If you've got ordinal variables where you're classifying a particular value as uh, you know, low, moderate, high, uh, then the method to use is uh, weighted kappa. And if you have categorical variables, uh, then it's Cohen's kappa. But if you're not, if you're not um, heard of these concepts before, um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If at some stage you have to uh, do some research that involves these concepts, you can always look them up. Right. And um, keep in mind that validity and reliability relate to quantitative research. So if you're doing qualitative research, then uh, again, you want to make sure that your qualitative research tool, your qualitative research study is also uh, of good quality, right? But applying these concepts directly uh, is quite uh, difficult because, uh, like I said, these concepts relate to quantitative data. There are some alternative concepts that have been proposed, uh, like you can see on this slide, there's something called truth value, consistency, confirmability and applicability. Again, these are measures of quality that are a little bit similar to validity and reliability, but I'm not going to go into the details. I'm no expert, but there's a nice little very short paper that I've referenced to that you can see at the bottom of the slide. And if you're interested, you can have a look. Okay, now I've got a few questions. So here's the first one. So you set an analog alarm clock to go off at 6 a.m. every day. You find that the alarm goes off at 6 a.m. as shown on the alarm clock in a consistent manner. After a week or so, you, you realize that you've actually been five minutes faster every day. Okay, so the question is, um, which of the following is correct? The clock is reliable and valid, neither reliable nor valid, reliable but not valid, valid but not reliable. What do you think? So I think... What do you think? It is um, quite reliable at waking you up when it clocks the six, but it's not very valid at actually telling you that it is six because he thinks it's six, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. So it is consistent, so we say yeah. it's reliable. Yeah. It's not very accurate, so we say it's not valid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right, that's great. Um, so that's just to reinforce the concept, that's all. Right, the next one is slightly more difficult. So you've developed a new scoring system for patients with bowel cancer, uh, and you're testing its predictive value in determining overall survival. Which aspect of the score's quality are you testing? Are you testing content validity, construct validity, inter-rater reliability, phase validity, or predictive validity? Yeah. So, so the, the thing I'd say first is, um, you know, I'm thinking, is this validity or reliability? And um, uh, it, it is not reliability because uh, yeah. you're looking to see how accurate this uh, particular scoring system is going to be. You're not looking at consistency at all. So you can rule out inter-rated reliability. The next thing you're looking to see is, uh, you know, uh, is there a gold standard? If there is a gold standard, you're looking at, uh, it should be criterion validity. Yeah, like yes. for a predictive yeah. test. If there's no gold standard, you can think of construct validity. If you're thinking, uh, oh, I just want to see if this uh, scoring system um, measures everything you're supposed to measure, whether it's relevant and comprehensive, then you do, then you look at con content validity, but that's not the question here. The question is whether you're able to predict something that you really know will happen in a few years that you, and you, therefore you do have a gold standard. Mm. So the answer is criterion validity, okay? Right, so the next one, this is a study from Asia. They've looked at a stoma quality of life scale for patients in the local language. Uh, to see if this can be used to determine quality of life and well-being in patients with a stoma. Uh, there is an existing English language tool. So they adopted this, translated this, assessed, got it assessed by an expert panel and also a group of their local patients. 
And then the scores were compared with other quality of life scales and pain scores, abdominal pain scores, to, to evaluate convergence and divergence. Convergence meaning, you know, how well it goes with other, uh, uh, how well it correlates with other scores, and divergence is uh, how poorly it correlates with other scores. So what aspects of quality of the scale are being studied? And the options are there on the screen. It's a bit tricky, but uh, I mean, the first uh, question is, are we looking at reliability or validity? Again, we're not looking at consistency here. We're just looking to see if the quality of life scale mm. um, really is assessing quality of life. So, um, well, I think if, if this compared with a with other scales that are already tested and the gold standard, that should be criterion again. Um, so for quality of life, you've got to think about um, mm. this construct as really never having a gold standard. Concurrent then. Yeah. Concurrent, so, yes. Um, so, um, so the first thing to say is you want to make sure that this quality of life score assess all aspects of quality of life, that it, it includes everything that is relevant and it is comprehensive. Okay, so that is face validity. Yeah. The next thing is you don't have a gold standard and therefore you need to see if the, this tool that you have really goes well with other similar tools. So that will be construct validity. Okay, so um, essentially face validity and construct validity is what you're trying to um, test for, for this new scale. Yeah. So uh, anyway, you, you've got to think about it sometimes and you've got to go back and look at the definitions, but uh, I'm sure you're not going to be put in a spot in, in an exam situation and be asked these questions. But if you're coming across a paper uh, or if you're doing your own research and want to look at validity, then uh, you've got to think about these concepts. Okay, so the thing to remember, um, the way I remember or try to remember is that validity refers to accuracy and reliability refers to consistency. Okay, and then you can build upon, uh, build upon the, the, this um, basic fundamental concept. So under the term validity, you got to think about content validity, criterion validity and construct validity. When it comes to uh, research papers or, or studies, then you think about internal validity and external validity. Um, under the term reliability, um, uh, the only two things that really is useful for us are inter-rater and intra-rater reliability. And just keep in mind that these relate to quantitative or measurement tools. And occasionally, especially when you're thinking of external or internal validity, they relate to the research itself. Okay, so there are a couple of uh, good references, or, um, or I thought they were good, that you can look up. And particularly, there's a textbook called Measurement in Medicine that devotes um, entire chapters to validity and reliability and how to assess them. And especially if you're designing your own research, um, it, it might be useful to um, have a look at these references and make sure that uh, you are making sure that your research is uh, valid and reliable. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.